let's all start a countdown um, until BetterHelp sends me a cease and desist letter. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before or hi, welcome if you're new. Uh, my name is Mickey, I'm a therapist and we talk about therapisty things on this channel. Today we are talking about something that I'm sure is gonna get taken down again, but we're talking about it anyways because it feels very important to me um, and to, you know, the industry of which I am a part. So you saw the title, you saw the thumbnail. We're talking about the better help slash care dash situation. There are a lot of private practice therapists who are very upset and have big feelings about this issue. Um, rightfully so, in my opinion. So I want to like short, shortly, I want to quickly summarize uh, the issue at hand for those of you who are not, you know, inundated with other private practice therapy accounts on Instagram so that you guys know what it is that's going on. And then I want to talk to you about why this is a concern, why me personally, in my own opinion, as a human being, have feelings about this, but also um, to sort of explain why other therapists, like especially if you're seeing therapy content about this on the internet, why those folks might feel the way that they do. I wanna be super fucking clear from the jump. I am summarizing factual information that exists on the internet and sharing my own personal feelings about those facts. I am not alleging or insisting that any of the fears or feelings that I have about the facts of this matter are true are actually happening right now. I am not making any statements about or for better help, and I am not asserting anything with absolute certainty in this video. My hope is that this video won't get cease and desisted again. I'm confident that it fucking will, but we are going to try to make a good faith effort to share this information from a like purely fact-based perspective and a purely like me as a human being, here are my feelings about the objective facts. That's what we're doing. Let's get into it. Also shout out to all of the goons at BetterHelp who are for sure watching this video because your boss made you. Sorry that you have to be here. Uh, <laughs> love you the most. I hope that you're getting paid a nice hourly wage to watch my content and send me a cease and desist letter. So for those of you who, you know, your Instagram feed doesn't look like mine, uh, it's not filled with other therapists, this is the situation at hand. As far as I can tell, um, I have found uh, statements from local chapters of the NASW, which stands for National Association of Social Workers, dating back to June of this year. It may have been going on earlier than that. I'm not uh, certain. But the situation is that private practice therapists, which if you don't know the difference between community mental health and private practice therapy, I have a video about that up here. Generally, private practice therapists are folks who work for themselves. We own our own businesses and we have our own client caseload. Sometimes we work in group practices where we have like maybe two or three therapists um, who all manage their own caseloads. They all sort of manage their own business, but it's very different than community mental health where like you have a large uh, like office building with cubicles and rooms and like the, the gross low grade carpet, that kind of a vibe. Private practice therapists basically work for themselves. So we pay for our own advertising also. This usually means that therapists have profiles on places like Psychology Today, on Therapy Den, on Inclusive Therapists, on Glimmer, on uh, Open Path Collective, places like that, where we write up a little profile about ourselves, we put some pictures of ourselves, we talk about our prices, our perspective, and publish this on the internet for a small fee, usually. Therapy Den is free though. And we put that out on the internet for the purpose of clients being able to find us so that if they want to go to therapy and they like us, then we can like bingo bongo have that working relationship, right? Therapists uh, have been finding, however, profiles of themselves on this website called CareDash, uh, that they didn't create. This has happened to colleagues and friends of mine, but I have also seen a lot of folks, I've seen a lot in my DMs from friends and mutuals um, saying like, oh my God, ew, I have this profile on this website called CareDash. I didn't make this. I don't want this to be up there. Um, I have also seen private practice therapists saying they don't have my address for my office, they have my home address or they have my personal phone number listed on this, this care dash listing and I didn't make this. What the fuck? How did this happen? There, like I mentioned earlier, there have been statements from several local chapters of the NASW, basically meaning that like the NASW, the National Association of Social Workers, um, this it's like a governing body for social workers like me who are therapists that help us, you know, abide by the rules of social work and do social work things. But they also have local chapters where you can like go to trainings or meet other social workers. And like, you know, they, they do NASW stuff, but 
smaller, like in your state, in your city, those types of things. There are a lot of local chapters of the NASW that have released statements addressing this issue because it's happened often enough that the NASW has given instructions saying if your information has appeared on this CareDash website um, and you didn't want it there, here are your next steps uh, for trying to get this information off the internet. They've done this because folks have reported having a difficult time having this information removed from CareDash's website. I cannot speak with certainty about whether that is happening or isn't happening or whether it is hard to take down or whether it isn't hard to take down because it hasn't happened to me, thankfully. I removed my profile on psychology today a long time ago and so I think Thankfully, there's not really any information <laughs> for anyone to turn into a fake care dash listing. So that's kind of like generally the issue at hand. But the second piece of this issue that's very important and why we're talking about better help in this video um, is because on these care dash listings for private practice therapists, which again, were not created by the therapist in some cases, what will happen, folks are, are reporting, I have heard that folks are saying, what happens when you click on that profile for a therapist who again, did not make this profile, you get redirected to BetterHelp's website. Um, folks have also stated when they express interest in working with this particular therapist. Let's, let's just like do a little example here so that it's easier to follow. Let's say that Jane Smith has this fake care dash profile that she didn't make, Jane didn't do this, right? But if you're just a regular therapy consumer and you're like, wow, Jane Smith looks so cool, I wanna work with her, you click the button to say contact now and instead of going to Jane's actual website, you're getting redirected to better help. Folks have stated that when they uh, express an interest in working with Jane Smith, once they've been redirected to better help, They've been told, ooh, sorry, no availability for Jane Smith. However, here are some other therapists that you can work with through BetterHelp. It's for that reason that local chapters of the NASW and other like therapy governing bodies have labeled these CareDash profiles um, as like factitious and false. Actually, what is the the real thing? What is it that they said? Mabel's birthday. Yeah, it's for this reason that several of the, the complaints or the alerts put out by local chapters of the NASW have labeled these profiles. Um, I'm going to read to you directly from one of the ones. I will link uh, in the description how to find this. It says, okay, so it labels them as an improper deceptive practice. Again, I want to be super clear. Um, the statements that I'm making about the types of profiles that are being made or like the impact of these profiles are like characterizing the nature of these profiles are things that I'm reading directly from other sources that already exist on the internet. BetterHelp has since responded to all of the backlash um, stating that CareDash is an entirely separate company, that they have nothing to do with CareDash's um, advertising practices, and that BetterHelp has since terminated their involvement with CareDash as like an advertising, uh, as a means to advertise their service. A lot of people are still very upset about this though, therapists in particular, and I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about why this is um, a fear for a lot of folks. So I know on its face, especially as a therapy consumer, this can feel a little bit like, what's the big deal? This was like a thing, it seems like it's being dealt with, and so like why is everybody still like up in a kerfuffle about the whole situation? Um, and so I wanted to provide some context and some background for the potential thoughts and feelings of other folks in the therapy community and especially for myself. I think it's helpful in this situation to draw your attention to a different industry that has like, similar vibes as what we're dealing with in terms of the like better help talk space cerebral sort of world, which is Uber. I have a whole bunch of links in the description for y'all to peruse at your leisure uh, if you would like to. But what we saw with Uber um, and Lyft to a lesser degree, but certainly with Uber in the like early days of the company were very, very low prices that were very appealing to a lot of people. Um, a convenience factor that was very appealing to a lot of people. And so Uber gained traction and popularity really quickly. There are so many articles that talk about like the death of the taxi cab industry um, and how this is sort of like shifted like the like transportation, like gig economy space um, since its inception. The thing about this that I wanted to draw your attention to is the way that Uber's practices have changed in the last few years. One of the sources that I will link below talks about how prices for Uber have gone up by 90% 92% since 2018. Um, you may have noticed this as a consumer, the prices are continuing to go up. And even though it's starting to feel like maybe this is not as convenient as like a cab, for example, or maybe not as cheap as a cab for sure, 
um, a lot of folks are continuing to use the service. And so the question becomes why. There are also a bunch of articles that speak about Uber in, in essence, promising their shareholders that they are going to become a mon monopoly or like wanting to become a monopoly. Um, and there's very much this energy in this space of like wanting to become the only logical choice for folks who are looking for like uh, transportation to and from um, if you're not able to drive yourself or take public transportation so much so that even if it becomes inconvenient or too expensive or like really not your most appealing option you don't really um, have the ability to choose a different option right I think this is a, something that a lot of people resonate with like me specifically as a like millennial person uber has always been a thing since I've been old enough to to drive um, and need it <laughs> like replacement transportation somewhere. Uber has always been a thing. Now as a 27 year old adult, I've literally never sat inside of a taxi cab. And I quite honestly, I don't even fucking know how it works. Even if I wanted to take a cab somewhere, I feel very intimidated by the idea of trying to find one or situate like I don't fucking know. Um, and so I continue to use Uber because the app is on my phone because it's easy. And like, it's just like the way, right? And this is very much a cultural shift. And especially if you didn't exist in the world or you weren't driving at the time that this became a thing, um, it's not really something that we think about a lot, right? The reason that I am drawing your attention to this is because it's an important pattern for us to observe when we talk about the gig economy seeping into other professions and other areas of life. This is something that we, at least me specifically, have concerns about and I have heard these concerns echoed by other therapists in this space um, about the like digitizing of therapy. Telemedicine is one thing, like private practice therapy and community mental health th health therapists um, practicing telemedicine for the purpose of like uh, safety now, even like during the pandemic, uh, but also for convenience and the sake of like meeting folks where they're at. That's one thing. But the like app based telemedicine and mental health services are like another thing entirely. Because again, we talked about this in the original video that got taken down, excuse me, that I chose to take down because I was sent a cease and desist letter. We talked about this there, but I don't even remember what I was saying. <laughs> oh, there, there's a distinct difference between app based therapy and private practice therapists, especially private practice therapists who work for themselves and only have a caseload for themselves. There are also like other concerns that I can't really talk about. <laughs> because <laughs> I'd like this video to stay on the internet. Um, hopefully folks who have like been here and are like are around um, can fill you in in the comments if you have questions about it. But the difference there is very important because when we talk about labor practices in regards to skilled labor, it's important to explore how different the quality of care that one might receive or the quality of services that one might receive differs in these two environments. We see this happening with Uber, especially where prices have continued to go up since 2018. They're continuing to rise now, especially as gas gets more expensive. Um, and yet Uber drivers are not being paid a living wage. This is a statement that Uber has made over and over again, that the company will be profitable once it reaches full scale. And we're not there yet. And so drivers can't expect it to be paid a living wage. And yet consumers are paying more and more and more money for something that is again like increasingly less convenient and less of an appealing option and so like the question in that scenario is like where's the money going um i don't think it takes a lot of reach to figure out <laughs> where that money is going in that scenario um and also to explore like how that impacts the quality of life of the person who is actually providing the service directly to the consumer particularly with uber there are lots of people who work for uber or drive for uber sorry if you can hear my dog by the way the like not so ideal working conditions uh, that come along with working in the app and how this again like affects the service that's then being provided from the like driver directly to the consumer. The concern for a lot of private practice therapists as app-based mental health services become more and more prevalent is that this is a, an issue that might potentially affect our ability to effectively work for ourselves. In essence, what I'm telling you is that some of the fears that therapists have about app-based mental health services are that it may become Uber-like in its scale, but also in its inevitability. And the fear is that we as private practice therapists will have no choice but to migrate to app-based therapy services in, you know, hopes of being able to make enough money to feed ourselves. There are very real concerns and fears that folks have about the pattern that has been displayed <laughs> by large telemedicine companies 
um, in these like repeated acquisitions of smaller companies and sort of like gobbling up these little service providers to become part of this larger conglomerate. And again, the fear here is like, where does this stop and at what point does it end? Um, and are we as like small independent private practice therapists going to be able to make a viable living without signing on to work with these larger you know, like proverbial powers that be in the telemedicine space. I guess what I'm saying to simplify is that the fear that I have and some other therapists have is that we will become the taxi cab drivers <laughs> in this like therapy space uh, where the work and the services that we provide are no longer sought out or like able to be sought out by consumers because the larger, you know, like corporate conglomerate um, has taken up so much space in this industry that consumers just no longer seek out these services. In in particular, a lot of folks are upset. Savannah, for fuck's sake! In particular, uh, the Care Dash Better Help situation was concerning to a lot of folks because of this presence of this button where someone would press uh, check availability or like, you know, connect with this therapist or what the fuck ever. Um, and then the consumers being redirected to better help without, uh, you know, like anyone really understanding that that's not the intention here. A lot of the fear that folks have is about the barrier to entry for working with a private practice therapist who's not associated with a larger telemedicine conglomerate becoming so severe that it is then like almost not really financially viable to work for yourself and being forced back into community mental health or being forced into working for the larger telemedicine conglomerate. I am also going to link a whole bunch of stuff in the description about a company called Teladoc. Teladoc is this very large telemedicine company that is making money hand over fist. Um, and they are uh, BetterHelp's parent company. Uh, Teladoc acquired BetterHelp in 2015 um, and absorbed BetterHelp's CEO as part of their um, staff, I guess. And Teladoc has demonstrated a pretty concerning history in terms of acquiring smaller companies. I actually, I'm just going to link the Wikipedia below, but also all of the supporting um, data because Teladoc has acquired company after company after company after company in, again, what is like a very concerning pattern to a lot of folks because they're continuing to acquire companies that sort of run the gamut in terms of like health and mental health care. This is also a pattern that other folks have spoken about with BetterHelp in terms of BetterHelp acquiring therapist directories. So for example, all of the ones that I list in my description um, and all of the therapist directories that I will recommend to y'all are directories that are not owned by BetterHelp. They are owned by themselves, like Therapy Den, for example, is owned by Jeff and another co-owner whose name escapes me. Open Path Collective is owned by the people who work for and with Open Path Collective and that's it. And that's the reason that I recommend them to you because they, as directories, are allowing therapists to advertise for themselves. So like, for example, when I had a profile on Psychology Today, that profile linked you directly to me. I don't work for a larger company who then disperses clients to me. You literally just get my fucking email address. BetterHelp in the past has acquired therapist directories or paid to be in therapist directories. Um, and the fear is that in doing so, and again, with Teladoc acquiring company after company after company, at what point are we going to reach the space where again, like therapists become the taxi drivers of this equation? This care dash situation was the first time, at least to my knowledge, first time that I've seen this happening in such a upfront and bold way where they literally stole people's information off of public places like NPIs and like other therapist directories and used it to advertise their own service. A lot of people felt very violated by this and a lot of therapists felt very fearful about how our digital information is being like used against us essentially. Again, I wanna be super clear, I'm not alleging that any of the fears that I have are the intentions or like the intent or the actual actions that BetterHelp or Teladoc are taking on purpose. Um, I'm simply speaking about my feelings and my opinions and the fears that I have heard echoed by colleagues and friends of mine. But I do want to encourage folks to, especially as therapy consumers, to be mindful. I know that there is already like a huge onus on therapy consumers. And in a way, this is kind of therapist's fault. <laughs> Not this specifically, but like because therapy as an institution, as like a larger field, has been really slow to adapt to times and to become technologically available to our clients. Um, this is kind of a side effect of us being slow moving and not appropriately meeting the needs of our clients. And so this large company with billions of dollars swooped in to sort of fill the, the void. But, and I also want to encourage consumers, especially if you, you know, have a bad taste in your mouth from 
large corporate telemedicine or from working with community mental health, please know um, there is a shortage of therapists right now, but there are private practice therapists who very much want to work with you and want to connect with you and there are still places to find them. If you are a person who does not want to work with BetterHelp or Teladoc or, you know, community mental health or like whatever, there are options. There are places on the internet for you to find these therapists and to find services that you can afford that work for you. Find a therapist that resonates with you, who will get you. And even though it does feel like it's becoming increasingly difficult to do so, it is not impossible to do that. Again, I will always link uh, sources and directories and places for you to find those therapists in my description. Um, and to my knowledge, all of those are, are again, like safe places for you to do that. Um, and if that changes at any point in time, I will be removing them. But for now, those are all safe and reliable places to find good therapists. And I also wanted to give the caveat here too, I probably should have done this at the beginning, but whatever. If you are a person who currently uses BetterHelp for therapy or you are a therapist who works for BetterHelp or someone who advertises with BetterHelp um, or Teladoc or like, you know, any of these like larger corporate companies, this is not shade or like me telling you that you suck or you shouldn't be doing that. Um, my primary concern is folks getting the help that they need and that they deserve. I do very much want to honor and recognize that BetterHelp serves a purpose for some folks. Um, and that it is the most convenient option for some folks. And if that works for you, that's fine. You're not a bad person. You're not personally contributing to the downfall of therapy as we know it. That's not the uh, assertion that I'm making here. My concern and my goal is in folks being able to find therapists and therapy and to, you know, connect folks with the places that they want to go. And so if you want to work with BetterHelp, that's your prerogative as an adult hopefully adult human being, um, and I'm not at all casting judgment on that decision. However, again, I do just wanna be clear, if that doesn't call to you or you don't like that or you don't want to work with them, there are other options that are available to you, and so please be aware that this uh, larger rhetoric that like better help is the option and that traditional therapy sucks or isn't attainable, that's not true. It is very much attainable. Regular therapists do sometimes suck, but all therapists, you know, sometimes suck. It doesn't matter if you're working for better help or not. Um, there are still good therapists who are willing to work with you and you can find them. So that's it. Let's all start a countdown um, until BetterHelp sends me a cease and desist letter as a like you know, end video throwaway. If you do want to read the season is this letter in full, by the way, um, or you just want to support me in the channel, you can become a patron. The link for that is also in the description. I uh, appreciate all the love and support from all my patrons always, um, but especially for topics like this where like I can't put an advertisement on this video. Um, I can't bank on the AdSense from this video at all. And so if you want to support the channel in any way, that's a great way to do that. So thank you uh, for all of you who do that. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to the channel. Leave me some comments letting me know how you think and feel. Um, I would love to have a productive and kind and respectful conversation with y'all about it. And that's it. Share the video to help the channel grow and to help each other grow. And I will see you guys next Saturday. Hopefully that's